It is well known that banks make money when they lend out consumer deposits. A customer deposits some cash at the branch. The bank keeps it until a loan application is submitted, is accepted, and the money is disbursed to the borrower. In a word, this is how banks make money and the foundation of their business model. What most people don't know is that there are a lot more aspects of the lending system than there would be if you were loaned money to a buddy in exchange for interest payments. The bank doesn't simply stash your money in a vault underneath the ground when you deposit your money into a checking or savings account. Instead, bankers lend your money to people and companies who need loans. In fact, most people might doubt that banks are a secure location to store their hard-earned money if they knew their money might not be there in the event of an emergency withdrawal. Wanna learn what fractional reserve banking is and how banks make money? Just keep watching. If you are interested in improving your financial knowledge to get the life you want, make sure to subscribe to our channel and activate the bell notification for more entertaining animation videos. There is a myth that is frequently circulated regarding the beginnings of fractional reserve banking. In exchange for a storage fee, ancient gold nests would keep precious metals and other items safe and ready for collection at any time. They might lease the gold and other valuables out as an investment, make money, and then return to the vault before the owner arrived to claim it, as opposed to holding the metals and having them sit idle. Depositors might remove their assets and bring them to a trustworthy person if they started to lose faith in their goldsmith. This suggests that not all of their depositors were acting in the same way, which would have put the goldsmith in an awkward position. This is, in a sense, how our current banking system operates. Worldwide, the most prevalent type of banking used by institutions is fractional reserve banking. In this scenario, banks receive deposits from clients and lend to borrowers while only keeping a portion of the initial deposit amounts. In case a customer requests a cash withdrawal, banks are obligated to have some cash on hand and accessible for withdrawal. The bank cannot just lend out the full $1,000 if someone deposits $1,000. They are just obligated to hold some or a small percentage of the $1,000 deposit on hand. Most are permitted to give out the remaining 90% of the deposit, which isn't really their money to lend, with the exception of the reserve, which is typically required to be held in reserve. This reserve requirement is set by the Federal Reserve, which can effectively create money to regulate how much of it is circulating throughout the economy. While lowering the reserve requirement posts money into the economy, raising the reserve requirements drains it. Big banks have the ability to earn huge sums of interest considerably more than you would if you were to lend some money to a relative for low interest because they can typically lend $90 for every $100 invested. In contrast to an individual, they don't lend money. In exchange for keeping the depositors' money with them so they can eventually write additional loans, the bank gives the depositor little to no interest when they make a deposit. The average account interest rate is not even 1% higher than the inflation rate. As an illustration, suppose a client inherits $500,000 and goes to the bank with it. Then a client arrives and submits an application for a mortgage to purchase a home. The bank lends the prospective homeowners $450,000 at 4% interest. In the past, you might have wondered how the bank can turn a profit by charging an interest rate that is just slightly higher than the rate of inflation. In reality, however, the bank is charging $18,000 per year or 4% for the money it lends for the home purchase, again, money that wasn't really its to lend. In essence, they are making $18,000 in interest on the $50,000 they put in reserves, giving him a 36% rate of return on the money they should be holding onto instead of lending it out. Theoretically, institutions are expected to preserve records of every transaction including quantities, time and savings deposits, vault cash, and any other data requested by the Fed, which is regularly reported. Some banks are not required to keep any reserves at all, allowing them to lend out every last cent of their deposits. Banks are compensated in the form of interest on reserves, which incentivizes them to maintain higher levels of reserves than required by law. 
Considering the interest that banks pay on their reserves versus the interest that you receive on the money that you deposit in a savings account. In the same way that people occasionally boost their savings, some banks maintain even greater reserves as an additional safety mechanism in the case of a large-scale withdrawal during uncertain times. Depending on how big the bank is and how much money it has, different rules apply. Small banks with a population under 16.3 million are exempt for any reserve requirements. Only 3% of reserves must be held by banks with assets between $124.2 million and $16.3 million, and large banks must maintain 10% of their assets, which is above $124.2 million. The portion of deposits held by the institution and not lent out is known as a fractional reserve. A bank must retain $15 million or 10% of its $500 million in assets. Fractional reserve banking has both advantages and disadvantages. It enables banks to produce returns on loans that would otherwise be wasted and retained within the institution by using their deposits. Additionally, this strategy enables banks to provide more credit to borrowers, which, in theory, boosts economic growth. Borrowers can use mortgages to buy homes, credit cards to buy commodities, and auto loans to buy new cars which keeps everyone content and the money coming in. Because most bank customers don't need to access their money at once, fractional reserve banking is effective. However, if every depositor tried to withdraw their money, this arrangement might leave the bank with insufficient funds. Many American banks had to close during the Great Depression because too many depositors demanded their money as soon as they realized the state of the economy. Bank runs are what this is known as. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation was created by the Banking Act of 1933 to provide protection for these clients. Your deposits up to $250,000 are protected by the FDIC even if the bank experiences financial difficulties. According to others, this approach overinflates the economy, thus building a house of cards that might collapse at the first sign of wind. In essence, this process creates more money and expands the available supply. Your interaction with your financial institution would be very different if fractional reserve banking didn't exist. They would need to demand far higher fees and interest rates in order to finance the loans. To make the same amount of money, they must charge around 10 times the interest rate. Consider what the mortgage interest rate might entail. The bank would have to charge you storage costs, just like the goldsmith. In place of paying a meager proportion of interest on your money. Additionally, banks would have to upload considerably stricter lending requirements, which would be challenging. Those who borrow have less than stellar credit. You may be wondering what gives the bank the right to charge such high interest rates. In any case, if you think back to the tale of the goldsmith's resources, they don't actually offer much in the way of value. You can make money and the community gains if you can put those resources to use in an effective investment. Consumers are not at risk from the fractional reserve system as long as the bank is FDIC insured. See the video description for our best videos to boost your finance knowledge. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more entertaining animation videos. Thanks for watching.